All right, welcome back. More news at the Sawa military junta that seized power in Niger in a coup last month has said it will prosecute ousted President Mohamed Bazoum, perhaps for high treason, over his exchanges with foreign heads of state and international organizations. The coup leaders have imprisoned Bazoum and dissolved the elected government, drawing condemnation from global powers in neighboring West African countries alike, which have activated a standby military force that could intervene to reinstate Bazoum. Perhaps for an update, now we're going to be joined by correspondent Ajit Mangut in Abuja, Nigeria. Nigeria. Ajit, good afternoon. Perhaps you can give us the latest, obviously on the back of the announcement by the junta in Niger to prosecute President Bazoum. What have been the reactions from the citizens on the ground as well? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the military junta in uh, Niger have said that they're going to persecute uh, President, uh, depose President Bazoum uh, for his engagement with international organizations and Western uh, countries uh, because countries like the U.S. and the uh, United Nations have said they've been in talks with him uh, and they have also raised a concern about his uh, deteriorating uh, health condition and the fact that uh, he is running out, he and his family are running out of food and water. U.S. has also said that it's going to hold uh, the military accountable or responsible for his safety and well-being. But uh, the, the junta, if you recall, uh, the reason why they deposed him in the first place, they say that uh, uh, his government was corrupt and uh, it has not been able to uh, end uh, insurgency in the country, which has led to the killing killings and displacement uh, of millions in the country and uh, this is coming at a time where uh, ECOWAS is threatening a military intervention even though it has said that it's going to explore diplomatic channels in order to ensure that they begin negotiations to reinstate uh, President uh, uh, Mohamed Bazou. Thank you for that. Perhaps we could also get to the sentiments on the ground and how President Bazou and his family who are in detention um, currently are doing. What are the detention conditions? Has there been an update since the 26th of July? Well, the junta has not said much uh, except for uh, the the reports of uh, prosecuting him for engaging with the West because uh, before the coup, he was seen as a, a key ally in the fight against uh, insurgency uh, or insurgents linked to al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, in the Sahel region. The U.S., France, and some other uh, EU countries have uh, uh, military bases in the country, and they've been training the military in counter-insurgency. Uh, but uh, what we've heard so far is the fact that uh, his health is deteriorating, and uh, they're calling for his release. Uh, and they've said that uh, the U.S. has said that it's going to hold uh, the military junta accountable because he's running out of uh, provisions. Uh, he and his family are running out of food, water, and his health is not in a good condition. Mm, any update as to the timeline set to unfold? I mean, you, you alluded to um, the response from ECOAS and whether the coup leaders are open to um, diplomacy perhaps to resolve the issue. Are there specific timelines that we're looking at? at this point, given the critical time juncture. Well, the, the junta has uh, refused uh, to open its doors uh, for diplomacy before now. Uh, we've seen ECOWAS sending uh, two, uh, three or four delegations to Niger, but they've uh, been turned down. An African Union and United Nations delegation has also been uh, refused entry into the country since the coup. Uh, but uh, at the weekend, some Islamic scholars from Nigeria were able to meet with the junta, and they have indicated interest in negotiating or, uh, or having a uh, dialogue with ECOWAS but at this point it's not clear uh, when uh, that is going to happen. Uh, the, the ECOWAS had directed its uh, uh, military chiefs to activate uh, an, uh, a, a military a standby force uh, in case of a military intervention, but it has always stressed that it's going to explore diplomacy and uh, military intervention is going to be the last resort. But at this point, it's not clear uh, when uh, this negotiation doors would be open for ECOWAS and the junta 
to begin talks to reinstate President Bazoum or at least have a transition uh, to uh, uh, you know, elections in the country that would uh, return democracy back to Niger. We're monitoring developments as that story unfolds. Ajit, thank you for your time with us. Ajit Mangut, of course, our correspondent in Abuja, Nigeria, bringing us the latest. We've just heard now the Junte Niger saying that it will prosecute President Bazoum for treason, perhaps um, because he was undermining internal and external security. So we're obviously awaiting response from ECOAS and that and what that means for the region at large, also the continent. Again, thanks to Ajit for that update. While staying with news further afield, ECOWAS leadership has shot itself in the foot by threatening to deploy a standby force in Niger. This is according to Professor Emmanuel Kwesi Anning of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Centre. Since the coup in Niger last month, ECOWAS has had two meetings where it discussed ways to return democratic rule to Niger. Meanwhile, the military in Niger has made changes to the cabinet and says it will prosecute the ousted Niger President Bazoum. Professor Anning spoke to SABC's international news editor Sophie Mukwena. Take a look. West Africa has set for itself a lot of norms and frameworks around democracy, constitutionalism, the rule of law, uh, anti-corruption measures, none of which have been followed through. So Niger is only one of a number of West African states that on the surface were democratic, but beneath that veneer of democratic structures and processes had all the structural weaknesses of corruption, unemployment, and of course, excessive and intrusive foreign interference. Niger epitomizes the challenges that the Sahel and West African states are facing. What could have happened to West Africa in terms of uh, ensuring that they have systems in place and early warning systems when they veered off the road? All our multilateral institutions are state-led institutions. The secretariats, say, of SADC, um, ECOWAS, IGAD, Commerce are incapable of challenging the heads of states where they are going wrong. So if we take ECOWAS, we have a panoply of frameworks from anti-corruption to constitutionalism to how elections must be held. We have probably one of the most sophisticated early warning frameworks and early response frameworks and also a conflict prevention mechanism. But in all these frameworks, the course was never able to initiate them. So we saw in Guinea how President Conde, former President Conde, stole money with his cabinet, changed the constitution. We've seen it in La Côte d'Ivoire. We've seen how elections have been held and manipulated. We saw how the government in Burkina Faso was not able to prosecute the war, but people got killed, 60% of the territory under extremist control. We saw corruption in Mali. When international institutions that states have voluntarily signed on to be members of fail to make their rules binding, then the utility of those organizations are according to question. And I think right now, as you and I speak, ECOWAS is fighting for its credibility and I suspect for its survivability. Because four member states, making more than 27% of the membership are under military dictatorships. Four or five of the states have also held elections under fairly dubious conditions. So multilateral organizations are important, but they must also be made to be responsible and responsive to the lived reality of their member states. Most African multilateral organizations are failing in this regard. ECOWAS has also included the option of military intervention. Was this a right move? Actually, they didn't include military intervention. They made military intervention the sole option by giving the junta a one week ultimatum. Now, that reflects 
a misunderstanding and a misreading of the processes inherent in the mechanism for conflict prevention, in the in the processes inherent in all the instruments that ECOWAS has established. Even more disturbing was that they also decided to send in the standby force. And that unfortunately sent a clear signal that those who were calling the shots themselves did not understand the gradual procedures towards using the standby force. Article 28.1 of the mechanism states very clearly that and spells out how force generation must be done. It is clear that the defense ministers had not met, that the CDSs had not met, and that heads of states met and basically just issued this order. They hadn't gone to their parliaments for authorization, mm -hmm. for the funding. You know, so ECOWAS has turned the processes upside down, leading to a crisis of credibility, a crisis of sending or an inability to send a signal that they are in control of what is happening. That is most unfortunate. So as I sit here talking to you, my main hope and aspiration is that we find a win-win situation in which ECOWAS and its leaders can regain some of their credibility whilst we engage the Janta in Yameh to begin to develop and design some transition process of sorts. Otherwise, this subregion is going to face more problems and worse ones. And you and I will have a lot of conversations. What is the role of international community and those nations who are currently in Niger? I'm talking about the Americans with their military base and also the French. So when we talk about the foreign presence in Niger, we are looking at about six or seven countries. The US were with this huge drone base, and you would notice that Secretary Blinken and the American leadership have refused to use the word, the words coup d'etat. Because were they to use the words coup d'etat, then the domestic American legislation will set in that will prevent them from even having access to the base and actually for being present in Niger. So you see that all this talk is not about democracy and it's not about the welfare and the goodwill of the people of Niger. It's about America's interest. France has been there, uranium, China is there, the Wagner Group is there, Turkey is there, the Czech Republic is there. Question, where is Niger's interest in all this? And for me, this is not about democracy at all. This is not about even the economic well-being of the people of Niger. What these partners want is an acquiescent Niger and its leaders who stand and look idly by whilst their resources are taken away. That narrative is beginning to fall apart. And the four coup d'etats, Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, and now Niger, are beginning a process of changing the narrative that says, look, hang on, where is our interest in all this? How do these partnerships help us? We want to rewrite the script in a manner that locates our people's interest at the center of these conversations. So if the US, France, Czech Republic, China, Wagner, Turkey, were all interested in building and supporting democracy and security, it beats my mind that they were so interested in security that they didn't understand the most fundamental and basic of, of security infrastructures. How was the government and its military relating together? So for Africans as a whole, we need to ask ourselves, how is security force assistance given to us? What is its nature? 
in whose interest? Because these people have run away from Afghanistan. They've moved away from Cameroon, where there is a war. In Niger, when force, special forces members were killed, America pulled back. So this is not about Niger. It's about resources and also the annoyance that look at these people. They now dare to wish to interpret what is their own interest. They now dare to say, we want to create a new African identity that protects who we are, knows what we want, and knows how to get it. That is where the battle is.